Ooh. Welcome, welcome everyone. It is a episode of The Word is Crystal Clear. I'm excited. I have Kim Lockett that will be joining us today and she has an incredible story. If you have been watching us for any length of time, you know my heart is to find stories of great recovery and turnaround and that is exactly what her story is about. Um, I know sometimes people feel like uh, the, the uh, narrative of I've, I've went too far or too many of these things happen, but God is so good that there truly is no such thing as going too far. He is the comeback king. He is the turnaround. And so God is so good. And so her story will bring uh, really light to that, to those kind of issues, those kind of thoughts maybe. And so I'm super excited for you all to hear Kim. Um, it's kind of funny how we met. Uh, her friend April um, actually had a wreck at um, one of our church member Mark and Jamie's house. And um, <laughs> like any good evangelist, which is uh, one of the areas that Mark leads is uh, evangelism. Um, as they were making sure April was OK, her friend, uh, they invited her to church. I'm like, that is a great evangelism strategy, right? <laughs> it works though. Whatever works. Amen. So, um, so anyway, so April and Kim both started coming with their families and, um, uh, April is a traveling spirit. I mean, she is a goer. She's I think in Colorado right now. So still both part of our church. Um, just Kim is there every week. She helps with the children's church now which praise God, if you've ever been in church leadership, the hardest rows to ever fill are church leader or church uh, children helpers. So praise God for that. Uh, Kim has something really special about her. She has a way of just speaking the God's, uh, the God's heart. Um, I love her in praise and worship. She just really has a way of, I don't know. She, you know, when some people, when, when the, the, singing and the praise gets quiet. Sometimes there's those people that are like loud and, and you're like, Oh my goodness, what's happening. But Kim knows the sweet moment and how to do it. And it's not even about her singing or what she says. She just calls in the heart of the father. And I just, I love it. So she's not even on the praise team. She's literally in the audience of the congregation. So I love it. She has a very specialness about her. So, um, and I'm sure she'll share kind of where all of these things came in. So without further ado, let's bring on Miss Kim. Hey. <laughs> hey, a happy or er, good afternoon or whatever we are. Depends yep. on where you're watching from, right? <laughs> so uh so I'm excited to have you on. Um I had heard a little bit of your story, I think in a testimony that you had shared um several months back and uh it just really resonated um I, I saw your redemption story, you know? Yes. So it was pretty yeah. exciting. Um, so one thing that I wanted to kind of have you define, um, mm -hmm. you know, pretty early on is um, I think a lot of times people don't really understand uh, what bondage is. So of course I'm going to have you pray for us first, but um, the, after that, if we will, I'd love to jump into kind of what that is. Cause you talk the tagline you wanted was from bondage to freedom. And so I early on wanted to find what that means. So let's okay. pray for us and let's jump into it. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Awesome. Uh, Father God, thank you for this day that you have blessed us with this time with pastor crystal, father God, thank you for you putting it on her heart to share um, the testimonies. Uh, Lord, we pray right now that uh, you come and just take control of this meeting and, um, and that we say the things that you want us to say and help people uh, lead to freedom, Lord Jesus, and uh, also answer some questions if they have questions or help them feel like they're not alone and they're not too far gone, Lord Jesus. Amen. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I totally, um, I, I, I love that the heart and desire for people to be encouraged. And um, I, I know sometimes when you've had kind of a rocky past or something, it's so easy to feel like you're too far gone or you know, yeah. nothing, nothing can save this. And I'm like, that's not the heart of the father. That's yeah. just not. And so I love your story. So, so Kim define for me, um, and you can do, uh, what you feel like bondages as a whole 
or even what it was for you personally, whichever way you want to, you want to run with that. Yeah. I think like you saying that feeling of being too far gone, Mm -hmm. um, that's part of like that bondage and, in that there's just so many layers, you know, bondage is feeling like you're not worthy, um, feeling stuck, depression, anxiety, um, anything that really holds you back from knowing your identity in Christ and knowing that potential that you have that he gives you as well. And so for me personally, um, you know, I struggled with unworthiness and depression and anxiety and praise God that I've been healed from depression and anxiety, delivered from it and delivered from unworthiness and shame. Shame, I feel like is such a big shackle that that's a big chain on, on people as well. I completely agree with that. Um, I, uh, you know, I've really actually been studying what it what is shame and, and condemnation and um, what like where that comes from. And as a, as saints, which is what the Lord sees us as and refers to us as um, we can't keep putting on like the coat of shame, you know. But if you don't understand that, it's really easy to do. And worse, a lot of times as believers, we put it on our brothers and sisters even after they've been redeemed and when we, we remember their past, but the father doesn't remember that. And um, I feel like that's so key to share because people miss um, that you don't live there no more. That's not who you are. That's not what you walk in. You know what I mean? Exactly. Absolutely. And Mm -hmm. having, I, you know, there's many things that are challenging walking with Christ and it's all about dying to the flesh. That's the challenging part. But you know, and for me, that spirit of condemnation, it was so hard to break. Um, it just, but once I broke it, it, once the Lord helped me see as well, I've been able to go back into some past areas of my life where he's led me to reconcile some things and walk through that knowing that I don't have to f- cover myself in shame or regret or anything. So. Yeah, I relate to that. Um, mine wasn't, I guess, so much as, as condemnation that was hard for me to break. Mine was more of rejection. And so that was a place that was really hard to not assume um, that I was rejected all the time. Or, And, and let's be honest, there's moments of flare ups. Let's, you know, let's, yeah. it's just reality. The enemy is not creative. He finds old, old uh, grooves and patterns and his idea is, well, it worked before. So let's see if it'll work again. And it's that let's try this again. And so um, my method to deal with those particular type of feelings is I want to call them out immediately. And so if I'm feeling rejected um, or if I'm questioning if I'm being rejected, I immediately go to the person that I feel like sees me that way. And I'm like, hey, am I misunderstanding this? Um, yeah. Are you meaning it to seem this way or am I in my head? I need you to tell me so I can shut that down, you know? And so how do you deal with uh, condemnation when it flares up today, you know, in the, in the current, when those moments happen? Um, well, I rely heavily on my spiritual mentors. Um, mm-hmm. And also like, I have to remind myself of that, like who God sees me yes. um, going up to people and like questioning them is something I'm still learning to do. <laughs> uh, I feel a little bit timid still uh, with confronting, not being confrontational, but just going up and being like, hey, I need some clarity. So um, prayer, my spiritual mentors, and just reminding myself who I am in Christ is really helping me. And I saw, I'm sorry for a sec, like going off yeah, I saw good. Tina's comment about her mm. depression and something that helped me realize um, depression is feeling stuck in the past. Anxiety mm. is feeling stuck about a future that hasn't happened. And right there in that middle uh. is Christ telling you that one, don't be anxious about tomorrow for today's worries has enough. And that too, he's going, he has plans for you. That's going to prosper you and 
a future that will bring prosperity and and health and wellness. Amen. I'm be careful with those words, but <laughs> um, I get you know, it. So, <laughs> but so yeah. So if we can, if you focus on what God says that He has for you, and um, you can kind of help get yourself out of that depression and anxiety yeah. area as well. Mm. I think that's really, really uh, good. And, and we'll jump into her story. Don't please don't anyone think that we're just, uh, we're not directional here, here, but I, I think when someone says something like they deal with depression, our goal in, in doing these, these lives isn't so much, uh, yes, it's about testimonies, but if we can speak to someone in the moment and say, Hey, like God doesn't want to leave you there and we can help you kind of tweak the way that you see your, the, the mindset, then, you know, let's, let's pull Tina out of this in the moment or let's give her a nugget that will help um, minister to where she's at. And so I think that's incredible to really, you know, explain what depression is versus what, um, what anxiety is. Those are very key thoughts. So, and she, she said uh, that she absolutely agrees with what you said. Um, I think a lot of times those two things go really hand in hand though. And a lot of times for you to feel depression, it's about a situation that's not going as you would want it to. Um, and shame and condemnation almost seem like the hooks that hang on to those things a lot. But one thing that I like to remind people as well is that um, things don't always go the way that you want them to in the season or time that you're in. But a lot of times if you'll surrender those particular things to the Lord, you will find that he will work those things out in his time, in his way. Um, I have a kid that I am just, man, I, we're, uh, I'll be transparent. I mean, I'm going to be honest. We are super struggling. I mean, it is, it is a nightmare right now. I mean, just honestly, I love your cup, by the way. I just saw that. That is adorable. That is awesome. That is so cool. But, um, it, but with the kid though, God has gave me a promise of where these kids are going. And there's not a drop of this current situation that looks like it's heading that way. I mean, for my earthly eyes, it would be really easy to declare hopeless, not going to happen. And I could fall into depression with that, but I refuse to because I have a promise and I have a father that loves that child more than I ever will. And so why allow myself to dwell on it, not being in my time or my way, but focus on what God is calling and has promised. And so maybe that, I don't know if that deals with her particular area or maybe that's for someone else, but I just share that because I want people to understand that trusting God to work in his time sometimes is exactly what you need to do Absolutely. to release that depression. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. I absolutely agree with that. Yeah. She yeah, says yeah. she loves your cup too. She just said that too. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, Kim. So let's kind of jump into this though. So where would you say um, this journey started for you? A lot of times people have really early life situations um, that, that cause a lot of these kind of uh, bondages to kind of set in place. Sometimes they're generational. So where does your story really, if, if you're really being honest with yourself, where does that really begin for you? Um, I think it's definitely generational, but it began when um, there was sexual abuse of, involved when I was five. And, mm -hmm. you know, I saw a lot of domestic abuse, a lot of drug use. Um, so uh, there were a lot of wounds that created, that were created by the enemy that mm -hmm. allowed for all that shame and regret and stuff to fester in there. Um, and I just, I didn't know, I didn't grow up in church. I, but I always knew that there was something greater out there. I always knew right. that there was goodness happening. I always knew that it was something working that my mom was able to feed us at the last minute or give us shelter at the last minute. Maybe it didn't look like the way shelter should have looked like, but you know, right. we stayed a little warm. <laughs> So, um, so yeah, it started at a very young, very young age. Um, and it wasn't until I was 30 last year when, um, I met some of my sisters on my, 
father's side and one of my sisters is a Christian and she was praise dancing. And there was this something happening to me where while I was watching her, all I could do was cry. So I went into the bathroom and I started crying. And I mean, like someone just killed my cat crying. You know, I was, <laughs> it was not good. I love it. Um, but as I was crying, I mm -hmm. felt like physically felt things being tugged out of me. And as I was, yeah. as it was being tugged out of me, I saw like this white mist and I don't ever really share this part because I didn't know you could see white mist, <laughs> but the white <laughs> mist came into me and it was peace wow. and it was healing. And I didn't understand it, but ever since then I've been chasing it. And now I know it's my Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. It's, yeah. Well, I love that. Let me just kind of like chime in there on that. I think a lot of times people um, feel weird about those kind of moments. And it's like, you know, God doesn't always, you know, appear physically. Let's be honest. There's, there's not always a physical appearance. There's not always, I don't think it's the same for any one person, but I don't think to me with all that I've seen, um, I don't find that weird or strange that, um, you know, for you, it appeared as a physical white mist. Like, why is it a white mist for you? Maybe because you're a person that needs to see something. Um, for another person, maybe it's a feeling. And next thing you know, you're twitching on the floor and feeling electricity <laughs> volt through your body. The point is, though, I feel like God appears to us how he need, how we need him to appear and how he knows that we will respond. Because he's Correctly. faithful and he understands us. So yes. I love that. That's awesome. <laughs> um, I also love what you said about um, I didn't grow up in church, um, but always knew there was something else out there. That is like, I resonate with it so much. Um, I remember like growing up and there being moments where I would be like, there, there's just something there's just something else in this world. There's just something more. I know God is calling me to something better. And like, I was doing all kinds of ignorant stuff. <laughs> and like, even in the midst of doing some of those, I always heard that. So I, I completely get that. And I feel like that God uses that kind of narrative that if we'll listen and we'll even be remotely open in the drug dealing, in the hot mess, in the, you know, debauchery of life, um, he can still speak to you and draw you out and, and, and says, Hey, there is more. So yeah. I love that. Yeah. So, absolutely. so you, you went through sexual abuse and these things, which more than not is kind of the narrative. in a lot of times, yeah. um, and, and there's always that shame that comes with it, which I went through it at five as well. I think that's like the magic sexual abuse number. I don't know. That's the age. I hate it. Um, but, always shame and condemnation seems to come in from there. So yeah. um, where did that kind of morph and grow as you hit, you know, those, those more independent years, those early teen and teenagers, like what went, what happened from there? Um, well, I definitely carried that shame and it influenced all of my decisions. I ran with the wrong crowd and mm -hmm. um, didn't treat myself or my body with respect and allowed pe other people to disrespect myself and my body oh, as well. Um, and that, you know, that includes, how do you say the word promiscuity? Um, I include, yeah. Yeah. That includes um, drug use. I used to be addicted to drugs and alcohol. Um, that includes dating women and polyamorous relationships. Uh, mm -hmm. So I just didn't know what worth meant and what my worth is. Um, and like I said, uh, it wasn't until last year when I was at my sickest. Um, for some reason, I would like throw up five, six times a day. Um, I was wow. constantly sleeping um, for three or three to six months, this happened. I went to all the doctors. I got all the pokes and prods. They couldn't find anything wrong with me. I went from two medications to over 20 in, um, in about a two month span. Mm. And I, it wasn't until one night where I sat down on my couch 
and I literally felt my spirit snap in half. And mm. I was ready to, you know, not to live on this world anymore. And I mm. was like, if there's someone out there, I need you to come help me. I need this. I don't know what to do anymore. And it wasn't until a few days after that moment when I saw my sister praise dancing and mm. that peace and healing came to me. And now with this realization, I realized that my body was healthy, but spiritually I was sick. I was probably deepest in my sin, like like no other. Um, there, there's a lot of struggle with lust. Um, and so, yeah, I was just very spiritually sick. I didn't know anything. And when I was healed, when God healed me, I stopped all medications. No, no, didn't have to wean off or anything. It was just wow. uh, no more throwing up. Um, my whole attitude and outlook changed. I mean, I used to be very, 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 um, what's it called? Temper, temper. Mm -hmm. Like I just had a bad temper. Like anger issues and, and yes. that kind of stuff. Yeah um my desires to be with women gone um all of that it was all because i was spiritually sick i didn't know who my father wow. in heaven was <clears throat> oops so i don't know if i answered your question uh, but <laughs> yeah so what does that look like? Because um, you, you were saying that like, as you, you got healed, you, you got off the medications and you're in anger issues and those kind of things begin to kind of go away and the desires to be with women begin to change. But um, I mean, let's be honest, people around you were used to the old Kim, um, mm -hmm. you know, speak to that for a minute and then I'll, I'll ask you uh, something else, but like, what did that look like as you began to change and like the people you know, you, you didn't just get drugs out of a vending machine. You didn't just, you know, you may have been in some kind of relationship that you had to break off. Like, what were those kind of steps and what was that transition? Um, so I think that was kind of hard. There were some people that I had to break off relationships with. Um, my husband has been very receptive of this welcoming new change of mine as well mm -hmm. but i think it was it was hard for everyone to adjust and me personally i've had some family issues where i where i was changing and my mind was being renewed and i my family was still kind of is staying where they're at where i used to be with them and so there had to be some distance there as well. Um, but yeah, I've lost some friends, friends. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, my, I haven't lost family members. I know God will reconcile those relationships for right. sure. Um, so yeah. And, and, you know, and personally it's been hard as well. There's, it's not just relationships that was hard for me. It was like, more worldly things like music and some tv shows they were just convictions of mine that god put on my heart that i couldn't watch anymore because of the things that i struggled with i couldn't be around these people anymore because i wasn't strong enough in christ to be in that environment you know that was his way of protecting me absolutely um, and I love that you mentioned even music because some people are like, oh, you're so religious. Music's fine. That's that's a huge gateway. Um, I remember when I was first really getting sober, you know, all those other times that I pretended I was getting sober. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I was finally really getting sober, um, listening to some music, even classic rock, because some people like assume, well, what are you listening to? Death metal or like, what do you listen to? Hardcore rap? Uh, at seasons, it was definitely hardcore rap and stuff, but even classic rock that I grew up listening to, like that would be almost like a traditional thing or, you know, something that, that just seems like no big deal to the average person. Uh, I mean, just as, just as an example of someone's like, what are you saying? Like um, even things like Tom Petty or something like that, that would just be like, you would not see that as being a big deal, yeah. but it spoke to a place in my spirit that made me want to do drugs. 
Yeah. It made me want to fellowship with that past self. Um, and that seems so like not a big deal, but fellowshipping with your past self leads you back to being that old self. Like that's yeah. a huge thing. That like, actually brings it <laughs> brings to mind. Like when I was sick, I used to smoke marijuana to help mm -hmm. myself and it right. helped. However, when God healed me, I still smoked. And I, then I started realizing like, oh man, I am so paranoid. I'm feeling a lot of shame. Um, I'm starting to see things. I'm starting to I miss these people that God's protected me from and, um, yeah. and a lot of guilt. And then I was like, wait, all of this is not worth, like, I don't have to keep going through this and putting myself through this. I, the right. my Lord healed me, you know? So, um, yeah, like fellowship, it was wanting to fellowship with myself and kind of stay in that environment, especially with smoking marijuana. So, yeah, I, no more marijuana for me. That stuff yes. opens portals and mm -mm, your eyes and ears are the portals to your soul. So whatever you're hearing and whatever you're seeing or yeah. And seeing like you're mm. going to take that in. So. Completely agree. Um, I smoked marijuana for like 20 plus years. Um, I started when I was like 11 and it was part of the like growing up uh, culture, you know, if you mm -hmm. will, or like um, my family culture for lack of a better explanation. And so uh, I just, that really stuck, that really stands out and, and resonates with, with me and, and kind of how the Lord just speaks to me because I, uh, I asked him to take it from me and it wasn't about if my husband said it was okay. It wasn't about if pastor said it was okay. I needed God to speak to me. And so I asked one day and I prayed and I'm like, Lord, I need you to show me and speak to me if this is okay. And I need you to tell me and no one else. And yeah. um, he just he just began to say things like, um, I'm going to take the taste of this out of your mouth and don't you put it back. But that that was towards the end of me realizing this wasn't going to work. There was journeys uh, or moments on the way in the journey where he would say, like, why are you smoking with people you're called to lead? And, you know, things like that. And it was like, oh. Wow this is a problem. And so I know a lot of people want to fight and argue over the medical marijuana. If you live in Oklahoma um, and people watch from all over. So, you know, every four or five buildings just about as a dispensary. And so mm -hmm. uh, it is pharmacia. It is a form of witchcraft. Um, it is. Uh, and I, I'm not one to say that there's never a time and place if you're dying of cancer and you have an extreme situation, I don't think there's anything wrong with using true medication versus a bunch of pills for an intermittent season, but yeah. living their habitual use uh, and justifying it for things like anxiety and depression and, and those kind of things. Um, I think it's more of you need deliverance, not so much yes. um, medicating for those things. And I, I'm sure I'll get in trouble for saying that. Um, it, it, well, my advice is ask the Lord yourself individually. Yeah, that, that's the truth, you know. Absolutely. I mean, I don't feel like the Lord will um, heal you from something, and then you s still feel like you have to have that 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 thing to live or to breathe. Mm -hmm. You know, He's going to be your sustenance. He's going to sustain you, um, not mm -hmm. anything synthetic or natural. You know. Um, right. So yeah, I agree. It just yeah. yeah. But God has a wonderful way of working those things out. Um, another thing that you had said was about that you having to let go of some friends. Um, there, I, I completely understand that. Um, I, I'm from another city or another state. And I had lived there like 24 years of my life or something close to that. And um, I, had a, I had a friend group that a lot of them were still staying in addiction for years and years long after I left. And God highlighted certain people that he showed me that, I genuinely missed, but it was also like the Lord was really telling me, you know, pray for those people and believe for them. And so I feel like as you continue your journey, that some of those people that will be highlighted to you in the past of um, that you used to be close to, that you may be able to pray into salvation per se. Um, uh, the two that were really the strongest on my heart to pray for actually have 
um, stepped out of addiction, got baptized, got saved, or both in church, um, spirit filled, like <laughs> they're both actually Pentecostal now, which is really hilarious if you'd known <laughs> them before. So uh, God is the God of restoration. So you may find yourself led to pray for those people and help to pray them into wholeness. So I wanted to yes. share that with you. That's Thank beautiful. you. You're yeah. welcome. You're welcome. So, um, so go ahead though. And uh, kind of tell us like how you, you got to hear beyond that transition of like the awkwardness of, of the trend. Uh, Cause I say awkwardness because as you step out of addiction, as you step out of, um, you know, homosexual type lifestyles and you get, you get those things broken off of you, but it's almost kind of a place of then what? So what did you begin to do that, um, that got you to a place of getting to help in children's church and, and knowing the word the way that you do? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it was, it's definitely a process. I had to go Oh, and like listen to where the Lord was pointing me. Um, you know, I, it wasn't, I didn't just start off at FFC. I started at a wonderful other church um, in Mustang. And that pastor, he really helped me understand and feel God's love and what God's love is. And then I felt like the Lord led me to another church. I don't church hop. I don't church hop. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and that's where I learned, I learned that God is a supernatural being and you can, he will manifest or he will show you himself in supernatural, amazing ways. And it was a unfortunate, but what's done for evil turns for good thing that I was led to FFC and there I started developing and understanding that, Hey, you you know, you may know of God, but you need a relationship with him. And mm -hmm. that's what holds you together is that relationship with God. And, um, you know, the, the encouragement that FFC has to read your word, to listen to the Lord, to, um, speak with your people, fellowship with them. Mm -hmm. Um, that has helped me so much. They, um, stand strong on God's word and his promises for me and um, and really obedience. I mean, a whole long life of not really obeying <laughs> um, now because I never really trusted people. I'm learning to trust God's word and know that when he asks me to do something, it's go always going to be for the, my, the good, the good, my benefit, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and with that, I spent, I think it's almost, it'll almost be a year in March or April that I've attended FFC wow. and yeah, it, it's gone by so fast, but since yeah. then, you know, just <laughs> soaking up the word, mm -hmm. um, pushing myself out of my comfort zone and realizing that I need people and God's putting these wonderful brothers and sisters of the faith in my life to help build me up and for me to speak life into them too. Um, it's allowed me to kind of flourish in the church and to serve and to be like, Hey, I'm here and God's telling me to do this. <laughs> um, so, yeah. And now I am the children's teacher at church and it's so awesome. I feel like, in my short walk with Christ right now, I've heard such a pattern about how many adults left the faith because they didn't realize they needed a relationship with God. So I think that if we're able to establish that with our children now, hey, yeah. listen to God, you know, you could hear God, you could feel him. He is tangible. He is reachable. You're not too far away. Um, that it'll help them stay in relationship with God throughout their adult life. So right. the God's really put that on my heart to help our children feel that and see that. Yeah. I think it's really important to build that foundation. 
Um, I think that um, if you have that foundation, it's so much easier um, in the moments of chaos and crazy and, you know, the world falling apart that um, you run back to kind of that place in your spirit of, Lord, I, I, I know I've felt you before. I know I've done some things. I know I've been away from you, but I know that you exist. I know that you're real. Like my twins are almost eight and they've seen healings. They've prayed for people and seen healings. And so that's incredible at a young age to have that because no one can take that away from you. You know, yeah. Uh, that's that's it's important to absolutely have the word. It's important to understand the gifts of the spirit, but it's also to, important to have experiences that when the waters rise, they can't be snatched back from you. Yeah. That's so, um, so I did want to ask you, do you feel like that you would have um, been able to make these changes, get off medication, step out of these things without being involved in a church? No. Um, bec and I say no, because even um, before I rooted into a church, I still was tempted and lived mm -hmm. in this very toxic cycle of not knowing that I used to think temptation was sin. So mm -hmm. if I was tempted, I would just go ahead and sin. Wow. <laughs> so, um, no, uh, being rooted in church has helped me not, or when I am tempted, understand that. Um, what am I trying to say? Like, understand that, uh, I can, God's going to give me a way out. He'll deliver me a way out of, out of that temptation. And before, mm -mm. no, I would just go ahead and do it. And then I would feel guilty and then I'd feel shame and then I'm crying for forgiveness and it was over and over and over again. And, you know, God's forgiven me for all my past, present and future sins. And I don't need to stay in this toxic cycle with myself, you, you know? Amen. I love that. I used to think temptation is sin, so I would go ahead and sin. Um, that is uh, a way that the enemy twists um, scripture or uh, him knowing that you don't fully understand. Um, that's one of the greatest ways, like greatest in the sense of not good, but um, most common ways that the enemy gets people to fall into things is because we as believers don't fully understand the word the way that we should. I mean, the word says that my people perish for lack of knowledge. This is yeah. literally what he's talking about because you thinking temptation is sin leads to you going ahead and sinning, therefore leading to shame and condemnation um, at greater and greater levels and living in shame and condemnation um, makes you feel worse about yourself, steals your identity, steals who God says you are, and therefore just creates like a cycle. And that actually puts you back in bondage. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And so yeah. that's a, that's a big deal. Uh, that is, a, that's a big concept that so many people honestly never understand and figure out. So I just, I really think it's incredible the things that God has, has showed you in the year. Um, it's been about a year, year and a half that you've been walking with the Lord, right? Yeah. Yes. Yep. And that's, that's so big. incredible how fast you <laughs> can move and, and go. Some people sit on the same pew for 20 years and never understand who God really is. And, um, and then there's people that are new that feel like, well, I'm just getting started and I have so much to learn, but like a submitted heart, the father can use. Yeah. And I was about to say that too. Um, being at FFC, there is a big emphasis on surrendering yourself to the Lord. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, when you give up control, like God's going to move in big and mighty ways. Um, and I used to think that too. Uh, so, um, I would get discouraged about like not being seen at church or, you know, mm -hmm. like, do people see me? Do they see I'm trying or do they hear me? Um, and one guest pastor at church came to me and she said, the Lord told me not to be discouraged, told me to tell you not to be discouraged about small beginnings. And I was like, oh, okay. Cause I felt like if I wasn't being seen or if I wasn't being heard or then um like i was failing and for me failure growing up meant i didn't have a chance to redeem myself there was no time there was mm -hmm. no relearning you know and failure meant physical punishment and so so um 
I'm losing my my I'm straying too much, sorry. <laughs> All right. Oh, surrendering. So surrendering, you know, like surrendering your yourself to God, it's um you're able to kind of help let go of those am I being seen type things and just do what he wants you to do. And then you, that validation that God's going to give you will happen. And, and not seeking validation through man. So when I hear things like if pastor ran pastor crystal, one of um, my fellow brothers and sisters say something, uh, words of encouragement to me, um, it's, or, and speaks life into me. It, for me, that's validation from God. Cause he's seeing where mm -hmm. I need, where he's telling me where he's seeing me, you know? Oh, I'm sorry. Right. <laughs> no, I understand. Cause the Lord uses people to speak to you and to bring encouragement. I think that that's safe as long as that person doesn't let the sun rise and set on what a person says to them. Yes, so agreed. There has to be a place of balance and understanding for sure. So yeah, I think that's vital. Um, and you know, and God allows people to be appointed to into a position. That's why I think it's really important that when people become ordained, that it's not a printed paper off of the internet, um, or it's not uh, they just start calling themselves pastor one day and they decide they are, therefore they are. I think it's important that you're uh, ordained under a house, a church that you have spent time in and they have been able to see the fruits of your life and things like that, because then that person can see you and speak, uh, you know, or say what the Lord is telling them and and speak into your life in that way. And so God has appointed that person into that position. And that's yes. that's very important. We can't just be out here self uh, proclaiming, self assigning. Because uh, then we get in trouble, right? <laughs> yeah, and that's why that's why church is so important. Like you know, growing up, my mom would used to tell me, you know, be careful who you're hanging out with because guilty by association type thing. Right. So you become a product of your environment. So when you're in a setting where people are um, have like the like minds like minds oh my gosh okay um and are seeking the lord and chasing after him um you, they're able to uh come to you and talk with you they're able to apply correction and love and help build you up you know uh, when you're walking with the lord you're not to be alone um yeah. maybe there's some solitude time that god will call you to uh however you know we are to be in fellowship with one another because we need we can't go through this life without each other i think in galatians um it says to bear each other's burdens is it galatians it's one of the books okay it's in there <laughs> <laughs> i've heard it i don't know exactly where either so you're not alone um, uh you know so i can't go through this life and I, I cannot go through this walk without the people that God puts me in and um, being able to um, not self preservate for that. I, you know, fear of abandonment and rejection right. is also a thing as well. But yeah, it's just, yeah. we need our, our people. We need our brothers and sisters. I think that sometimes the enemy really is great at using what we often call church hurt um, to cause us to self-isolate. And um, I think that that's a big thing as well. And um, not only does church us a church hurt lead to self-isolation, but it helps to get you to a place of, of distrust. And like you mentioned before, um, a place of self-preservation, which kind of is very similar. Um, but, you know, God wants to be our comforter. Um, that's one of the names that that um, he uses. He is our comforter. Yeah. He is our protector. And so whenever we are being our own protector, our own comforter, in reality, I know a lot of people don't, don't like this, but um, in a way, you're kind of playing the Holy Spirit. You're kind of, you know, playing the God of your own world. And um, also when you're not fully submitting to the Lord and and um, dealing with whatever comes, just trusting him to deal with it, then, um, you know, you're you're missing part of the walk that God's called you to have. 
yeah. pieces of the puzzle that are honestly very vital. Um, and I posted up here, uh, you'll surrender to who or what you're surrounded by. Pastor Wren um, shared that with me quite a bit as I was dealing with the addiction. Um, he he always knew we were, you know, I met with him every week. It was very open and, and all of that. And that's the reality, though, that the camp that you surround yourself with, it's a matter of time before you surrender to it. Um, are yeah. there times that we're called to go back into, you know, maybe the clubs and help pull people out of it or the places of addiction and pull people out of it? Um, yes, but that's when you're going, you know, two by two, uh, you should never go alone. You should always go for a time when God has called you and told you to go, um, not before, because you may be putting yourself back in the, the firing range. And so um, there's wisdom and times to reach back into darkness. Absolutely. Um, but it does have to be God ordained moments. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the other thing I was going to ask you is um, where you, you said that you feel like church is really vital. And, I, and we, we talked about that. But um, where do you honestly feel like you would be now had all of this not happened? I mean, do you feel like you you would have actually ended up killing yourself or more medication? Or what do you think would have been your outcome? Um, probably definitely more medication. I think you know, I have attempted suicide twice in my life, mm -hmm. um, but that that desire to not want to live was kind mm -hmm. was gone. But I don't know if I would have mentally been strong enough to do it without medication. Mm -hmm. um, like just being on my own. No, I couldn't be on my own anymore. <laughs> you know, right? So no, I. That's a really hard place to, to actually to, to get, um, you know, I think the majority of people at some form or fashion at different seasons maybe has certainly dealt with a desire to not be here. I don't necessarily think all of desires to not be here equals suicide necessarily. I think there's, there's kind of a misconception or misunderstanding there, but um, the desire not to be here can lead to a desire of suicide. I think it's kind of the, the starting point that often morphs into the bigger problem, I guess, um, yeah. the gateway situation. Um, but the thing about it is though, had you not stepped into what the Lord had for you or has for you, um, I think it would have continued to affect your family, your son, your husband, and things like that. Um, how have they changed in this process of, of you getting free and all of that? Yeah. So um, kind of going back to the whole generational thing, um, mm -hmm. my son, well, okay. First I have two kids. My daughter lives in California with her dad and that's a matter I am not able to speak on right now. But my son is with me with my current husband. And um, when God healed and delivered me, I realized that I was passing generational stuff down to Jeremiah. And uh, I could see the negative effect it had on him. Um, so we went through some some therapy and lots of prayers, a lot, a lot of Jeremiah being prayed over as well um and now you know jeremiah is flourishing he's building a relationship with the lord we talk about the bible he's speaking um he's actually speaking about how he feels and so he he used to be he used to shut down you know yeah. like i did um my husband uh you know he's a uh, on his way <laughs> you know mm -hmm. you understand what i'm saying yeah he's very supportive of this change and um my faith in christ i think it god will call him whenever it's his timing for him <laughs> yeah but right now right now i you know living a godly life is something that will help win him over and it says that in peter as well so yeah, but, I think the testimony of your continued path speaks a lot to people such as your husband that is seeing the change in you. Yeah, yeah. It's not without difficulty sometimes, you know, sure. because, because, you know, all this change is, 
I'm very careful now, like we were talking about earlier with our eyes and ears with what Jeremiah is consuming as well. Um, so those changes that are happening as we are set apart of the um, set apart, but also living in this world, you know, there's just, mm -hmm. that's one of the things, the changes that's happening with Jeremiah too. Like there's lots of talks about what we see in the world and it may look fun, but it's not healthy to us, to our walk with God. And, you know, mm -hmm. we want to do things that help, that can please God, you know, and be an right. example to our, our friends as well. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, sin full blown leads to death. I mean, um, it, it does. And, you know, um, I, I've studied a lot of deliverance and, and, you know, done several of them. And one of the, the things that, um, well, well, for example, the nefarious movie, when we watched that recently, one thing that um, the character in the movie actually talked about was how it starts small as uh, stealing something, uh, I think a toy car it mentioned, and then like a Ouija board. And, and I wish they would have expounded upon that point because people don't realize how much, even as a child, little, little sins, um, morph into more and you move the boundary line just a little milli inch and a milli inch and before you know it um you know uh, stealing a car and i know this isn't everyone's case but morphs into stealing money from your mom's purse or morphs into stealing cars it can it's not necessarily a set path um you know other life things shape and and alter what you lead into doing but it still morphs into moving the boundary line of what is true and whole and pure to a place of oh it's not a big deal and next thing you know the not a big deal is a huge deal you know it's just a little pot yeah. you know what i mean it's just a little yeah. alcohol and you know those places for me led to both addiction at one point uh, yep. For each of them, I was an alcoholic and pot was the hardest thing to quit, you know, and so a lot of times people don't realize that. So I love what, what you're saying there, um, you know, and the generational things um, and, and you've seen those begin to go with your son, I'm assuming with with the changes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I. Uh, I would absolutely. I'm one time Jeremiah came to me and was like, mom, I saw an angel at school. And I mean, he was just weeping and sharing how, like what goodness it was and how um, powerful and amazing he felt that presence felt. And before that, you know, Jeremiah uh, used to wake up screaming at night, having dreams about the devil taking him to hell, you know, so it was once my chains were broken and I realized, oh, I am now the chain breaker in my family where my son no. is being <laughs> delivered, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Amen. So, yeah. I love that. As parents, we have to realize that, especially with her, your son's six, something like that. Seven. Seven. Yeah. Um, but it's, a, it's, it's below the age of accountability and, um, that's a place where parents are supposed to be taking their authority and, um, you know, speaking life over their children, refusing to let um, children, you know, participate in certain things that are demonic. And um, it, it is 100 percent at the parent's doorstep of stopping those kind of generational things, those sinful things, for example. And, I, and I'm sure people won't love this either, but, um, you know, I don't allow Harry Potter movies in my home. I don't. I grew up watching Hocus Pocus. I loved it. But if you look at it with a Christian eye of uh, what the father, you know, is, is leading us to do, it is pure witchcraft. It's a spell book. It's sucking the souls and life out of a child. I loved Hocus Pocus. I am so butthurt. I didn't get to watch the second one, but I can't with a clear conscience do it. And right. more than that, more than my own self uh, desires and thoughts and all that, because we said before, you got to protect your eye gate, you got to protect your ear gate, like what comes into you. I can't let my children watch that. I can't let them do that. And so um, it's it's a hard place. It's a very uncool place, but it's vital that we're not our kids, kids friends 
and yeah. um, condoning behavior that leads to their destruction. You know, a lot of people miss the verse because of the verbiage, but it's it's essentially saying if you spare the rod, you will spoil the child. Um, wow. And it's like, oh, you, you know, we, we often say, oh, you're spoiled. And like, it's a, you know, ha ha thing, or you have a lot of toys or whatever that implies, you know, or you get whatever you want. And we say that passively, but the problem is we actually create monsters and we mm -hmm. lead our children to a place of destruction. And then we're mad when they're locked up or we're mad when they're on drugs or we're mad when they're held in captivity, but it was the place of us sparing the rod and, ending to a place of spoiling the child and really i'm gonna say it you're gonna say stand it. before god for what you allow your child to do yeah you will stand before god and you will give an account to every word you said every movie you condoned every and i got chills on that because i know that's the word and i know that that's the facts and so the places that we gave up territory um I heard, I heard a parent say recently, if I enforce that in my house, do you know the level of hell that I will face? Do you know the level of hell that you're allowing on your child by being Ooh. passive and refusing to call out the stuff and stop it? Yeah. Like, I, I would rather wage war with a 17 year old, a five year old, whatever, um, than deal with the, the standing before God, the most just judge ever. And trying to say, well, it would have been a really rough season or maybe my kid would have been mad at me, you know, or it, I would have had to take away their car. And that means I would have had to done X, Y, Z, like plug in the narrative based on your age group. But like God's not going to be like, oh, so they would have had to sit out a season of volleyball. You're right. Let them do the witchcraft. Let them do it. Yeah. Are you serious? You know what I mean? Like. We have to stop playing patty cake with the enemy and we have to get serious about our children and what is right and stop trying to be our children's friends. I, I, I believe there's a place and a time that you can have a friend type relationship with your children, but it is well past 18. It yeah. Is well past 18. I agree. Yeah. And, um, you know, I used to be a very permissive parent too. I was, um, a lot more responsive than I was, mm -hmm. um, authoritarian but mm -hmm. uh but now you know and i because i was so permissive jeremiah and i know kids don't really understand accountability but mm -hmm. he didn't really see examples of accountability either and so he he's learning that as he watches mm -hmm. me hold myself accountable and hold him accountable and so there are those struggles where he was is was very much used to um, things being me being passive about it. And now I'm putting my foot down. No, like, no, yeah. and you can't do this. And this is the reason why, and I'm standing firm on it. You can have your fit cry. Go ahead. Um, I still love you. God loves you. And that's way more greater than my love. And I need to harness that. And I want yeah. you to feel that, you know, that's the most important thing. Um, so yeah, I agree. <laughs> I agree. I yes. I I have to keep my foot down, even if it's hard for the family. If God's directing it, then that's mm. all that matters. Yeah, and I will say one more thing about that um, before we wrap up. I um, I really think that it's really vital that. Um, we realize that the bigger fight comes when we have to turn the ship around versus just starting off that way. Um, but this is the place where there is a, a special level of grace. I really believe it is when you don't know better and you allow certain things. And then as you know better, as, as the Lord reveals to you um, the places that are, are bad that you were allowing or whatever you want to call it, that um, as you help your children to understand these things, that if you, if you turn that ship and you turn that, those things around and you stand on what God has called you, it may be a rough season, but God will bring restoration to those areas because it's a place of you doing the right thing. And that, that, that moves the heart of the father. You know, yeah. obedience is better than sacrifice and obedience is what God is wanting from us. And so yeah. I really feel like it, it's harder if, if you have to turn the ship around later in life, but it can be done. 
and um, the younger the better. I mean, let's let's be transparent. Fighting a teenager is a whole lot more trouble, um, but it's also more of a, like a nine one one immediate need. Um, I'll be honest, there was a season where I allowed my kids kind of a wishy washy. You know, church was optional. And the war that it took to turn it back around was really hard. Um, but the testimony of my own life was important. Um, and that spoke a lot to them. And then I made things non-negotiable. And so, um, it, you know, God, God was gracious. And now um, my oldest is in school. She finished school in advance. Uh, or, you know, ahead of time, she's determined to go to Oral Roberts. Uh, the next one's on the prayer team. The next one wants to be in leadership. So there's okay. places where God has brought restoration, though the fight was hard. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And thank you for that encouragement. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, God is good. And I just, I feel like that there's, there's people that will hear and see this that will, um, that that'll resonate uh, a lot as well. Uh, let me see, Michelle, one of our friends that we met at Glory in America. Um, it says, my son is seeing the change in me since I started what my walk with the Lord, um, which is helping me bring him to the Lord. Um, mm -hmm. And it's even harder when they're an adult. Michelle's son's an adult. And so it is a turnaround process, but it can be done. And um, mm -hmm. I feel like personally, sometimes the further we are from the Lord, the greater restoration and the more of a testimony that restoration becomes. And yes. so... I feel like that's, that's a reflection of what has happened in your life. I know it's a reflection in mine and some of the craziest stories of, you know, prison or, or, you know, these just really hard paths um, just shine so much light and victory for the father. So, yeah. so that can be Absolutely. in our kids and that can be in us as well. Amen. Amen. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. Well, I really appreciate your time, Kim. Is there any words of encouragement or anything you want to, leave people with before we have you pray us out um uh, just keep seeking the lord he just like pastor crystal said there you're not too far gone he will restore it all um and when you feel uh any discouragement seek brothers and sisters of the faith um spiritual mentors or mothers or fathers yeah Amen. Amen. It's vital to walk. Even Jesus sent the disciples out two by two, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so That's right. We're not meant to do this alone. So, all right, Kim, we'll pray for us and we'll shut her down and uh, go about our day. All right. All right. Well, Father God, I uh, just thank you for restoring me and me being able to share my testimony to um, everyone. It's been um nervous, nerve wracking and awesome at the same time. <laughs> uh, and Lord, I pray that these words that Pastor Crystal and I have spoken um, really break strongholds on people as they hear this and 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 hardened hearts are uh, are softened and you put it within them a new spirit, Lord Jesus. And uh, in your name we pray, Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much, Kim, for being on and giving us some of your time. And uh, until next time, we'll see you soon. All right. All right. Thank you, Pastor Crystal. Thank you. God bless you. Bye bye. So, guys, I hope you enjoyed today. Um, I love really just letting the Holy Spirit move. Uh, some of these testimonies are graphically detailed. Some of them are moments of sharing the word and um, what we feel like the Lord has said through our journey and not so much about us personally. And I love each and every one of them, uh, no matter which direction it goes. Cause I know God uses us. We yield our mouths, we yield our spirits and we just yield our plans. And when you do that, God speaks to people in ways that we may never know. And that's okay. Cause this really isn't about us. It's not about clicks and likes guys, clicks and likes will fade away. Trust me. So um, next up uh, in, uh, I think, a week and a half-ish, something like that, um, I have Michelle on here, Michelle Hunsaker, 
um, some of you know as her as Michelle Vanetta. Um, she will be on here. We will be talking about a difficult topic um, in her life um, about uh, eating disorders and addiction. Um, if that is something that you have dealt with, please do make sure you catch that next episode. I will post the, the official date very soon. Um, but God has restored her in an incredible way. And she is she is doing some pretty awesome things that had she stayed where she was, she probably wouldn't be alive, much less serving the Lord. And those are the topics that we look for, guys. I want to hear about the redemption stories. I want to hear about the ones about uh, abortion or prison time served or addiction or homosexuality. I want people to hear that this is the heart right here. The heart of the word is crystal clear, is, is again, not about me, but about giving people a safe place to share what God has done in their life and how they have been restored from the darkest of places. And that's what we want to do. And so if you know of a story, if you have a story, um, message me, comment on here, whatever that looks like. And let's get you some time on here so that we can share about what God has done in your life. Okay, so I bless you. I bless you in the name of Jesus. I ask that Lord will make sure this gets to the people who need to see this, that people have eyes to see and ears to hear, that they will have hungry hearts to receive the words that were shared today. The encouragements, Lord, um, that you will put this in front of the right people. And I ask that people will just be blessed and encouraged as they come and as they go. And I just thank you, Father, for what you're doing in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray. Amen. Love you all. God bless you. And until next time. Bye.